Hey everybody, welcome to DC Daily from home. I'm Hector Navarro and I'm wearing pajama pants right now. Joining me today is the lovely Miss Amy Dallin and the strapping young lad, Mr. Sam Levine. Thank you so oh. much for joining me today, guys. So excited Thank to you, be buddy. here. Yeah, I too am wearing pajama pants, of course. It's the new normal. Really, really wearing it. I'm really wearing it. Okay, all right. What are we doing here today? We're here to talk about 1995's classic Batman Forever, of all things. So let's just jump right into it. First topic, Val Kilmer has taken over the role of Bruce Wayne slash Batman from Michael Keaton, who played him in Batman and Batman Returns. Honest thoughts, Val Kilmer is a replacement. What do we think? Ladies first. Honest thoughts? I remember, look, I, I have to grade the 90s Batman movies on a scale of how mad I was when I saw them. And the answer for this one for a young Amy was, it's, you know, fine. Uh, not one of my all-time Batman, but uh, do not remember leaving with the same feeling I would have a couple years later during Batman and Robin. Oh, uh, well, hey, if I could just defend the Cloonster for a second. George Clooney was playing a version of the character that he has gone on record and saying that like he was allowed to move on as an adult man from the tragedy, right? So he played him a bit more of a fun-loving billionaire playboy. You know, I think he did a good Bruce Wayne, but not a stellar Batman, and that whole movie didn't build him up. Anyway, uh, too much of me. Sam Levine, let's talk about Val Kilmer. Okay, so here's the thing. I, I know I'm a teeny little bit older than you guys, so I was 13 when this movie came out in theaters. And at that time, I'd probably seen Batman and Batman Returns somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 times each, <laughs> probably more. So, Ooh. you know, of course, Michael Keaton w was and always will be my Batman, as they say. Um, so, uh, but I like Val Kilmer, I really do. Like, I loved him in The Doors, which I had somehow already seen at that age. But I liked, I liked seeing Val Kilmer. I liked that they were kind of James Bonding Mm -hmm. uh, with the role of Batman. It was like, look, it's, it's not always going to be the same guy. It's, it's going to be the same character, but not the same guy because it's the yeah. character you love. I, and it, I, yeah. I, I, I bought it. I went with it. I think it was a different era, you know, uh, movie making was different and you nailed it on the head, Sam. It was the James Bond era of movie making. Contracts were more powerful than the continuity of having the same actor, but you know, which is now that's the superhero standard, it feels like today, to have that continuity. Amy, why don't you kick us off with this next topic, talking about the movie itself, overall, 1995, Batman Forever. Was it too family friendly or was there enough grit to enjoy? This is Batman we're talking about, go. This is a false choice and the fact that it's a false choice is part of what went wrong with this movie. Because if you remember 1995, we already knew that it was possible to make something that was both family friendly and stylish and cool and sophisticated because they were doing it on television in the animated series. Boom. So we already knew that was possible. It was, it's not that inherently being family friendly will make things less effective. You just gotta get lucky and uh, execute well on your aesthetic choices, which it maybe didn't do so much as well. Yeah. Sam, what do you think? I just, I think, I mean, I don't know that it failed. I think they were trying to go for it. But Batman Returns and Batman, uh, I think Batman uh, Forever was going for a different thing altogether. I think they were reinventing the bat wheel, if I may create a phrase that I hope people will start using in their daily lives. Um, I think that what Joel Schumacher and the studio were doing was saying I mean, if you think about, and I hate to use the same comparison, if you think about like the Sean Connery, James Bond movies from the 60s versus another 1995 film, GoldenEye, how very different yeah. those films look. I think this is, it's kind of the same thing. So it's not the Batman that the last two films had been. It's not the Batman that so many of us loved. But I didn't mind that they were rolling the dice and taking chances. And, you know, they it, it, it towed the line of family friendly at times and then towed the line of being outrageous and, you know, not for kids and other moments. But I don't mind that it's kind of a grab bag of, ah, let's see if this works. Ah, let's see if this works. It all works. Yeah. If you like Batman, it all works. Speaking of that grab bag, we have to talk about some of the standout performances. I say standout because they are very memorable. The performances of which I am referring to are, of course, the villains. I think definitely echoing a 60s Batman flavor of that exaggeration. We're talking Jim Carrey as the Riddler and Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face. Now, there has been a little famous behind the scenes skirmish where 
TLJ, as I like to call him, has said that he didn't necessarily want to be co-starring with Jim Carrey, who was the hottest hot actor at the time, because he knew Jim was going to go 110%. So if you know that going into it, you can see TLJ doing everything he can to keep up with that energy. And I'm like, I don't know if Tommy Lee Jones is that energy. I don't know if the character of Two-Face should be that energy. But those are my thoughts on Ritter and Two-Face. Sam, why don't you start us off this time? What do you think about the villains? Well, I, of course, love the villains. And I, I too, know about that backstory that TLJ, as you like to call him, Thank you. Uh, was, was not a fan of working with uh, uh, JC. Um, that's Jim Carrey, not the yep. other JC. I don't yeah, know yeah. what his take is on that. Yeah. Um, but uh, but the, the thing of it is, uh, you know me, Hector, I'm a movie lover. The year, well, three years before, TLJ played an insane over-the-top villain in Under Siege. Okay. So okay. for him to say, like, ah, I didn't want to go that over-the-top. You know, I had to keep it up so crazy to keep up with Jim Carrey. I was like, buddy, you got to rewatch Under Siege. <laughs> because you were chewing the scenery in that movie mm -hmm. and you were totally great in it and you were great in this. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it makes me sad to think that Tommy Lee Jones, you know, maybe isn't happy with the job he did on this movie or, or doesn't look back on it fondly because he's great as Two-Face. He is insane um, and so much fun to he's watch. He's insanely fun to watch. I mean, he's no Billy D. Williams. <laughs> But, yeah, um, we're going to talk yeah, about that that's recasting. Right. That's, that's right. right. He, ha he had to turn it down first. Really? He had to yes, he was legally uh, required to get the offer first because of the contract he had after Batman 89. But that's another story. Wow. So I thought Tommy Lee Jones was great. And Jim Carrey as Edward Nigma. JC. Inspired. JC. Inspired. The greatest. Amy, Amy what's your take on the, the the duo villains of this film do they stack up with penguin catwoman do they stack up with solo joker from the first batman film they are, do they hold they, their own they're in a different style but here's the thing where i'm gonna go with sam especially for me at the time watching them i completely accepted them as legit versions of these batman villains uh it's obviously possible to do them in slightly different styles but if they had set out in this direction and not gone 110% it would not have worked. This was these versions of Riddler and Two-Face to the hilt. Uh, and so I, I kind of, I have a lot of love in my heart for both of them actually. I would agree with that. I think that especially when you look at Jim Carrey's Riddler, he is channeling so much of this in insane like chaotic energy that a lot of fans have been like, you know what? He would be a good Joker. He has a lot of similar vibes to the Joker. And you fast forward to today, there was a, a, a really popular comic book run recently. Tom King wrote The War of Jokes and Riddles, where both, both of these characters were trying to vie for like, no, I'm the funny, crazy villain of Gotham. And so I, I think that if Jim Carrey hadn't gotten us there with that performance, we may be thinking of Riddler in a different, like somebody else would have come along and been like, okay, Riddler is actually like this. And that would have become the standard. But because of Jim Carrey's performance, I feel that a lot of people will put Edward Nigma in the same sort of like, you know, chaotic energy as the Joker. They got the suits. They've got the elaborate traps. You know, they can be funny. They've got like, good hair usually. They got good hair usually. But moving right along, I want to talk about some of the supporting cast members. If Billy D. Williams was recast and Bruce Wayne himself was recast, one character who was not recast was Alfred Pennyworth. That's Alfred from top to bottom. Yeah. He was magnificent. May his memory as Alfred live on forever. Uh, but he's tremendous. I will always think of him first when I think of Alfred. And you have to keep in mind, I adore Michael Caine. Now, there's, it's never a bad time to have this Alfred in your life. Uh, it is interesting that you mentioned Batman can't exist without Alfred because we're seeing how that plays out right now. But I mean, spoiler alert, I don't think in the long term it's going to go well. I hope he comes back real soon because oh. it's never right without him. R.I.P. R.I.P. The fictional character of Alfred as well as the actor that we're talking about right now. Yeah, um, yeah, I would agree with that, Amy. But again, this is early Batman. And the, the really interesting thing about Batman Forever is that even though there were rumors that we were going to get an earlier version of this character with the Tim Burton films, we finally get to Richard Grayson. Dick Grayson, Robin, premieres in this film. There's a little line where maybe his name could be Nightwing. Real cute little joke in there. But we have got Batman and Robin. And people knock on the movie Batman and Robin for the suits having nipples. But lest we forget, Batman Forever did it first. That's right. 
arguably did it best. Eh, I don't think they were so best. subtle. But... No, if you, 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 well, it's look... a pass fail. You did it or you didn't. <laughs> Follow up question. Do any of you think that either Val Kilmer or Chris O'Donnell bodies actually look like that under these suits? I mean, who are we kidding with the sculpted foam rubber? That's the, that's amazing. Those abs are so shredded. The, the veins on the legs. It's a, it's a choice. <laughs> oh yeah. I just noticed that. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, I'm certain they were that cut. I'm certain they were. <laughs> uh, well, gang, this has been an, a delightful journey in the Wayback Machine talking about 1995's Batman and Robin, but we cannot leave you without a DC Daily from Home special exclusive, mm. our rendition of the hit single Kiss from a Rose by Seal, the most iconic song from a Batman movie of all time. So let's take it away. Da, 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 there are da, 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 so many things a man hey, can tell you, you so much he so can say. say. You. You. That's enough of That's that. Plenty. Right, That's plenty. That's way more than we needed. This has been an absolute delight. Until next time, stay safe, stay home, wash your hands. We'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.